Good morning. Good morning. Um, thank you for having me here today. I, when I received the call or the text um, and asked would I um, mind sharing and speaking, I was extremely excited, um, humbled, and um, then I said, oh gosh, what did you get yourself into? <laughs> um, but I, uh, over the last few days, I had been um, praying and meditating and saying, you know, um, what is it that I am to share? What can I help um, impart and hopefully, you know, make a difference in someone who's in here, you know, someone's their day. So I, I, I heard from the Great Spirit, talk about you. So I said, well, that's easy enough. I, I love me, so uh, <laughs> I'll share it. So, um, so a little bit about me, I am, um, I grew up, not too far from here in Malden, Massachusetts. Um, my family, um, mom and dad, they're from Georgia. And uh, there were three things that, you know, I did as a youth. I played sports, I went to school, and I served the Lord. Those are the three things that, that I did. Um, and one of the things that I absolutely loved to do so much was, uh, was play basketball. Absolutely loved it. Um, but I had this sort of um, issue with me was proving others wrong. So if you said, you can't do this, you can't do that, um, I had to prove you wrong. And that went with anything. If it was you know, on the basketball court, if it was in class, if it was you know, singing a solo in church, no matter what you said, what they said, I had to prove them wrong. So fast forward, I'm, I'm in college and uh, playing and having a great time and I'm entering my junior year and it's off season workouts. And going into the junior year, we are able to move off the dorms, out of the dorms into off campus housing. So me and my, uh, my roommate, she was actually a huge track star. We were moving from our campus dorm to the off-campus apartment and it was you know an April afternoon and you know, it was beautiful we had spent the whole day in the apartment you know painting and decorating doing you know what we wanted to get the place ready and as we left the apartment and we were walking down the street I um, I could hear something in the background and I said to my friend, I was like, do you hear that? And she was like, hear what? I said, I think it's a dog. And what you may not know about me is that as a kid, as a young person, I was deathly afraid of dogs. I don't care what it could be, the little tiny like purse dogs or it could be a German Shepherd. If it was a dog, I had no business being in the same area that dog was. I just felt like the dog is here, I need to be over there. That's it. And she said, no, I don't hear anything. And I turned and I could look like, you know, in my peripheral vision, I said, no, there's a dog there. And I could see this dog and it was absolutely, in my opinion, that day, and I'll take it to my grave, it was stalking us like it, it, we were its prey. <laughs> this dog was hiding behind the bush and then taking one step, like the whole thing. And she, I said, see, there's a dog. She was like, don't worry about it. Don't, don't do anything, the dog will leave us alone. I said, no, no. I turned and the dog started running. So I started running. She started running. So being the intelligent 19 year olds we were at the time, we said, let's run into the street because dogs never run into the street. We were right, the dog didn't run into the street. We ran into the street and all of the cars just stopped. Stop, and we're there, except for one car. And I could see the car, it was a blue Ford Taurus and it came from three cars behind and it went around all of the cars. And as it was coming, we were frozen. I couldn't move out of the way. The car hits us, bang. I'm on the roof of the car and the momentum from the roof of the car propelled me 50 feet in the air. And as I was flying through the air, I could remember saying to, to God, whatever you do, don't let me land on my head. I don't care what happens, just don't let me land on my head. So 
as I'm flying through the air, completely peaceful, I land not on my head, but when I land and I can get my bearings, I notice that my left arm is behind my right arm and my right leg is over my left arm. And I knew something wasn't right here, but what really made it profound was that there were two men's basketball players. Any men's basketball players in, in the chapel? Raise your hand. There you go. I, there's something about men's basketball players. They're just so profound. They came over, <laughs> and as I'm laying on the concrete, and I knew them because we were in school, and their exact words that I will never forget said to me, yo, ma, you messed up. It's like, <laughs> thank you, thank you. Can you call 911? <laughs> no lie, still a good friend of, of mine. He's the head coach at uh, Hamden Hall. Ryan yells, 911! <laughs> Thankfully, other people are getting out and they're calling and, and they're and, and they're calling 911 and there's an off-duty nurse who lays beside me and she's telling me, she explains who she is and she's saying to me, just be still, paramedics are on their way, just be still, be calm. I said, no, I'm fine. And she just started praying over me and she was just reading scripture over me and scriptures that I knew as, as a child and, 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 and growing up in the church. So um, I was completely like relax, paramedics are coming in, and uh, y you know, while I'm laying here, kind of all, you know, in different kind of forms than God created me to be. Um, one of the paramedics says, "Okay, we're going to have to cut your jacket." And just so you know a little bit about me, I really enjoy fashion. It's just something I like. And this jacket I had was a Pele Pele butter soft yellow jacket. Like it was everything. Like when I mean everything, when I walked into the dining hall, everybody saw me with this jacket. Like this jacket was everything. And here I am laying there and I said, and he said, is that okay? And I was like, no, you can't cut my jacket. Thankfully the nurse was like, cut her jacket. So cut my jacket, they get me on the, uh, on the gurney and they're loading me into um, the ambulance and I said, what about my friend? Now mind you, this whole time, I had never lost consciousness. I said, what about my friend? And the paramedic said, we'll call your friends and your family when we get you to the hospital. And I said, no, my friend's here. They're like, no, no one's here. I said, yes, she is. She's over there. The only thing I can move was my chin. I said, she's over there. And they said, what? I said, she's over there. She was hit as well. Well, this stretch of road, it, it was massive. So they had two lanes that went north, and then there was a big island and two lanes that went south. Well, when the vehicle struck us, it kept me 50 feet in the north lane, but she rolled into the south lane. But none of the cars, no one had seen her because she actually landed in the storm drain. You know, we're in the south and there's these big storm drains because they have tornadoes, all of this stuff. So there's big storm drains. So she's in there. So, so a fireman goes over there and the only thing I can hear is, say, hear is him yell, we have another body. Well, she was unconscious the whole time. No one had known she was there. She was just laying in there. Cars were going by so they had to stop the road, you know, um, take care of her, get her, um, get a, another, um, paramedic unit to come and get her. So both in the hospital and, um, you know, she's still unconscious and I'm giving her information, giving my information. Um, now we're, we're hours and hours. She's from New York. I'm from Massachusetts. We're away from our families. Um, they get our parents, you know, so the next day they come in, they see me in, um, in the room and they said, look, your leg is broken in six different places. Your shoulder is completely shattered. And my question was, well, can I play basketball next week? Again, 19 years old. And uh, he said, no, you don't understand. 
you're probably never going to play again. We don't even know if you will ever walk again. And when he said that, I remember looking at my parents at the foot of my bed and getting extremely angry. So they said, but the problem is that your leg is so mangled that we have to wait a week so we can have the, we can remove all of the muscles from around the, the bones. And we're not able to do it. We have to bring in a, a surgeon, you know, that specializes in this. And the only surgeon that specializes in it is um, from the New York Giants, you know, because they normally see these kind of compound fractures on the football field or in the field of battle. So try to make it a long story short, they, a week later, they operated, um, you know, fixed my leg, my leg from my knee to my ankle to this day is titanium and my shoulder, my rotator cuff is, is plastic. Um, but they would sent me from the hospital with, you know, we're gonna see how this works, but there's no guarantees. You know, the bones may not um, hold up to the fusion of the titanium. You know, we'll see you in about six months. So for six months during, you know, the end of the spring, all of the summer into fall, I'm just at home with this cast and this arm and like this robotic thing that it was like a metal, it was just awful. And I remember finally at about the six month mark, I was sitting at my mom's um, island and I was trying to read the Bible. And I remember going to turn the page and I couldn't turn the page. And during this entire process, I had never like really cried. Never, I just like, let's just go through it. And I remember crying out to God saying, how will I ever do what I love if I can't even read your word? And at that very same time that I called, that I called out to God, my grandfather, who was like my biggest hero, my grandfather called me. And I answered the phone and he could tell I'm crying. And the only thing that he said to me is, you will outlive your darkest day. You will outlive your darkest day. That was, hung up the phone. I said, okay, Lord, what is it that you want me to do? And I'll do it, whatever it is. If I never play basketball again, I never play basketball. The doctor said I can't do this but I'm gonna fight them every way. I'm gonna do what I can. I'm gonna do physical therapy, everything I do. So 18 months later, with a lot of help, a lot of prayers, a lot of hard work, I was able to get back on the basketball court. And I remember the day I was on the basketball court I was playing and the surgeon, or actually the doctor that came into my hospital room and said, you will never play again. You know, you may never even walk again. He looked at me and said, my God. And I remember saying to him, no, my God, because I had the faith to believe. And I, and I tell you that story for, for a particular reason because I think that a lot of times we spend a lot of en energy on what they say, what they say about us. You can't go here. Um, you're not smart enough to get into that school. You're not talented enough to play there. Um, you're not strong enough. There's a lot of they. You know, they are always saying this. And we sp I would spend a lot of time trying to prove them wrong. And I'll show them. You said I can't, you know, get accepted into, into this high academic institution. I'll show you. You said that I can't own my first business by the time I'm 21. I'll show you. You said I can't, you know, you know, get multiple degrees. I'll show you. I spend a lot of time worried about what they were saying. And then it finally like, came to me and clicked one day when I was just running myself ragged and I heard the voice, the still small voice in my spirit that said, I love you too much to hurt you and I'm far too wise to make a mistake with your life. And I remember that. And I remember it because of so many scriptures that I had grown up on. And from that point on, 
I started living my life not to prove them wrong, but to prove his promises to me were true. So everything that I do is to prove that his promises to me are true. And I don't know where you are in your life today. I don't know what's going on, but I do know this, that the creator has put, put things in our hearts, desires, secret petitions, dreams, not fantasies, but dreams that are too grand for you to do. And you might even be concerned that, am I crazy to think that I could actually achieve that? Am I just completely all the way out in left field by myself thinking that this is something that I actually could do? What I'm saying to you today is that you have to believe that. Believe that it's meant for you. It, it's, it's meant for you and you're going to have to work at it, but you have to believe that it's meant for you. And you may not even be able to share that with your loved ones or, or the closest people to you because they might tell you, you're crazy. You know what, and, and they're gonna, they would be right for that because it's not their dream. It's not something put into your heart. But if it's something that wakes you up at night, if it's something that you can't shake loose, if it's something that every time it comes back and it reminds you like, why don't you go for that? Why don't you try for that? Why don't you believe for that? then it's something that was planted there for you. It's a seed that needs to be watered with your work, with your belief, with your dedication. Don't give up on it. And don't try and go around and prove other people wrong. But instead, I encourage you, prove what the creator spoke to you is true. Thank you all. I appreciate you all.